longer than usual. My latency is terrible. I don't know what's up with my It's internet. the blue go live button's revenge. No, it's fine. And we're live. It and is live. Thursday, December 30th, 2021. And we're not allowed to have fun anymore. But we are allowed to be a little bit late because of tech issues. And to have Sorry, Renee DeResta on the show. Hi, Renee. Hello, friend. Renee so DeResta. Hello, hello. It's so good to be here. Sorry that took like... That was that was so arduous. That was like my YubiKey freaking out when I was trying to yank it back out of the computer. So the last <laughs> time I saw you, Renee, it was in person. I know. Now at, we can't at, do that at again, our right? secret society uh, meeting, and yep. now we're. I feel like this is a real. You're not allowed to have fun anymore. Moment because we are back in online as two dimensional uh, squares, um, and it's the ultimate expression of Omicron regression. Yeah, that's good. So yeah. I'm celebrating with a, a sloth shirt. Um, uh, I think, I, and I've, it's in the spirit of the day through which most of which I have slept. Uh, and uh, we are here to talk about uh, Renee's hatred of the city of San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what we're here to talk about. But we are going to indulge your desire to talk about this. With Renee no, for a I, bit. I had my one tweet about it, which somehow got like more tweets, like more likes than anything important that I've said in like the last couple months was me saying like, I left San Francisco and I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, but, but in fact, that. in fact, whenever I have seen you, Renee, for the past uh, or spoken to you for the past uh, two years, um, most of what you have wanted to talk about is your seething anger at the Bay Area. That's so, fair. So, um, so there now you have a platform. You know what? What's your beef with 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 San Francisco and the larger uh, uh, Bay Area? I actually really like the Bay Area. I lived there for ten years. I moved there in twenty eleven. Um, I had three kids there. I you know, got married there. Um, I it it. I'm trying to think of the. Um, it's a it's a machine town, and as such, it's unaccountable. And it's it's really remarkable to have a to be involved in a local political community where there is no accountability and there is no change, and uh, we just sort of repeat the same things over and over and over again. We have politicians who purport to be socialists from their three million dollar houses, you know, blocking housing by uh, trying to evaluate the historical significance of defunct laundromats right you know there, there was just there was so much of this and over a period of about 10 years i was like i can vote with my feet and the beauty of american federalism is that i can go live somewhere else you know <laughs> god bless democracy so you know it was um i i really i love the place i really enjoy it's it. really the decided... people you have a problem with. It, no actually it's it's <laughs> it's not the people the people are fantastic too actually it's the leadership it's it's the most remarkable thing seeing a, a wholly unaccountable machine in which people just fail up into different jobs instead of ever like being voted out you know <laughs> that i think was the thing for me where i was like um I don't know if it's just that this is where I lived from, you know, turning 30 to turning 40, right? Or like this formative period where I was actually paying attention because all of a sudden I had kids, you know, and I had, I felt like I really had skin in the game where uh, local politics was actually directly impactful on my life in a way that when I was in my 20s in New York didn't really feel quite so true. Um, so it could have just been uh, where I was, uh, you know, as, as um, in my life and the, um, the way that that, that that particular machine operated, but I, I just, uh, I, it was the frustration of believing that a better system was possible, but there seeming to be no way to get there that I think was, uh, what, was what made me both an activist, but also a deeply frustrated person, and so I left. So, um, so that we transition seamlessly, and um, my, I, I don't seem to be being uh, abrupt. Uh, how or, did yeah. how did how does this relate to your your history of study of the anti-vax movement? Well, I'm actually going to take it. I'm going to take over one second and say that, like, like Renee, when we met, I think that John started working for Foursquare. Yeah, I know your mayor. Your mayor. I, know, I have the mayor, mayor T-shirt. Yeah, this for you. I know. Um, but he started working for Foursquare in January of 2011. And I only remember that because I was in law school and it was like, uh, like, cause I like measured life by semesters then, which I continue to do. But there, um, 
but we met you and you were working at, I think at Jane street and he had had like yeah. a bunch of interviews there and like had been very like into kind of the micro trading kind of like thinking about wanting to do that. And then you went to like Foursquare, but then we had a bunch of friends in common ex Googlers. And this is like, I don't know, 10 years ago, a decade ago. Easily. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And were you yeah. living in New York then? Yeah, yeah, I grew up in New York. Um, yeah, and that's what I, I thought. I moved to SF in 2011, but I, I'd been in various parts of um, Yonkers, yeah. then Brooklyn, then Manhattan, um, yeah. East Village for so that decade. Moved, yeah. And then, like, I put 2015 in the in lieu of fun, like, kind of, like, tweet. But then I kind of realized, just like, was it 2015? I'm kind of, like, estimating that in my own mind based on, like, when I also started going into kind of this exact area because I feel like we had these like oh we met each other didn't have that much in common then kind of like went these different ways and then like kind of like met up a couple years later and then like went different ways and are kind of met up again and i just think it's a really interesting tale but like when did you you said you had skin in the game when you moved to san francisco but your skin in the game and your activist kind of profile is also what caused you to kind of come into dealing with anti-vaxxers which were then And I really do think that this was the case. And I thought of it at the the time when you were dealing with this, no offense, that it was like a fringe movement. (laughs) I know, but like, seriously, it seems like- Who could have guessed? I know, (laughs) I know. So, but like, but tell us the story of like, kind of how you got into this. Yeah, so I um, I had my first son, I have a, a boy and two girls. I had my son in 2013 and there was this thing. So I moved from New York to San Francisco in 2011. And um, I was, I'd been on Wall Street, as you noted, I had a very quantitative job then I moved to San Francisco because I, I wanted to be I, I felt like I was kind of done with Wall Street, but I didn't know what I was good at. I didn't know what I could do besides, you know, move numbers around on, on a spreadsheet. And so I, um, I came out to the valley and I took a junior venture capital job. And I, I wanted to see like, could I be useful as an engineer again, in some way do product job, you know, I wanted to get into um, the SF tech community and, and see what it was about. And I had my first baby and I was um, I was doing a lot of um, trying to sort out where I was going to send my kid to preschool, <laughs> which is a thing that like much like if you're in New York you or in D.C. or in a lot of a lot of big cities, you have to get on these stupid lists like years in advance. And so one of the things that I had heard about California was that it had a big anti-vaccine movement. This was distinctly different than New York because of differences in local laws. California had this thing called the personal belief exemption. You could just say, I am not going to vaccinate my child. And that was the end of it. You could just Oh, yeah out of, uh, of school vaccinations. Now, I thought this was absolutely insane. This was one of these, like, because you can't do that in New York. And so I um, I started looking at data for schools. The California Department of Public Health had actually very transparent data. And so I started pulling it. And then I realized I could actually pull 10 years worth of data. And I, I was like a board quant that had nothing really quantitative going on in my current job. And so I started taking that 10 years of data and analyzing it. Um, and I started in around 2014 writing blog posts about what seemed to be this policy that had led to a really sharp decline um, in MMR vaccination rates over the years to the point where we had dipped. Many, many schools had dipped below the threshold of the kind of um, 95 percent needed to maintain herd immunity in, in the classrooms. And so I started writing about that. And then the Disneyland measles outbreak happened. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> here it is. Like, this was what, you know, that, that trend seemed to be heading in that direction. What year I, was that? It was in 2014. And then the Disneyland measles outbreak was in 2015. And okay. so I I called my local representative. I called my state senator. It's the first time I'd ever picked up a phone and called a representative. And I was like, can't we do something about this? Like, surely there's some way to, to deal with this. And the answer I got back was the anti-vaccine movement is very well organized and there's no impetus to do it. After the Disneyland measles outbreak, I called back again and I said, surely there is impetus to do it now. You know, we have 200 and some odd people who have just got the measles in California in, in you know, 2015. Um, and they said, yeah, actually, a senator in Sacramento is going to be introducing a bill. Why don't you call his office? And I called and I said, look, you know, I kind of have a data science background. I'd, I'd like to help you where I can. I've got I've been doing these analyses. I've been looking at it by assembly district. I've been looking at it by zip code. I have all these ways of like chunking this last 10 years of data. Can I help you in some way? And he put me in touch with um, two other women. One's name is uh, Leah, Leah Rusin, who lives in Palo Alto. And Leah said, I'm starting a group of parents to, to serve as a counter a counterweight to the anti-vaccine movement. We're the senator is introducing this bill. We want to start a grassroots community to push back against the anti-vaccine movement. And I said, okay, I'd like to help with that. You know, I, I can um, 
I can run Facebook ads, I can run a Facebook page, you know, we can grow this counter movement. And we kind of thought it was going to be easy. I mean, we just thought like, oh, you put up a Facebook page and like, boom, you've got your movement, right? And so I, <laughs> through the, the naivety of, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, like, I like, well, I can do you this, say, you know. <laughs> you, say, you say that, but like now it really does feel like, when we talk about kind of like the like the like the white supremacy movements and like everything else, that all you need is a Facebook group and then you've got your movement and it feels oh, yeah. that way. Um, and so like I'm just saying like when you're depending on which side of this you're on, it seems both like unstoppable and like you barely started. Um, well, that was that was actually kind of my 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 takeaway from it. So we started doing this. We made a Facebook page. Um, my job, you know, within our purely volunteer organization, this was my like 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. job, um, was understanding the opposition, right? So I did uh, most of the opposition research, which was um, a lot of quantitative network analysis, actually. We could see the conversation happening on Twitter. We could see the hashtag SB277. I reached out to a data oh, scientist, um, Gaurav Lokan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I reached out to um, to this data scientist who was at BuzzFeed at the time. Or no, actually, he was at BetaWorks at the time, um, Galad Lotan. And I said, hey, I'm I'm seeing these accounts. And as we, uh, you know, the bill was referred to three committees in the House and three committees in the Senate in the state of California, this bill to eliminate the personal belief exemptions. That This is what SB 277, the hashtag referred to the number of the bill. And as we were following the public conversation around the bill, the first hearing was in the health committee, was in the Senate health committee. And the opposition put out their usual kind of like, oh, vaccines cause autism and these sorts of, you know, health related misinformation tropes that went nowhere. Um, and they pivoted hard all of a sudden. And in the second hearing, recognizing that that had been a losing cause that the senators did not believe the false health claims, they instead began to lean very heavily into the idea of liberty vaccination is parental, you know, is, is a parental decision. It is state tyranny to have any kind of requirements for vaccines for schools, let alone ones that you cannot opt out of. And so that was an argument that attracted adherence from many other parts of the political ecosystem. And so that was how the anti-vaccine movement went from being this very niche kind of health focused, crunchy granola moms that, that people tend to think about that. You know, I see Jenny McCarthy kind of popping up in the chat that kind of very like, um, yeah. lefty liberal thing into this, all of a sudden they had broadened the tent, if you will, and they were uh, reaching out to what was then the Tea Party. So this was, again, pre-Trump, so this was just the Tea Party, and they were saying, hey, you should be part of our movement to, um, you know, because the nanny state of California is trying to make kids get their measles vaccines to go to school. Uh, and so that was where you started to see that the way in which networked activism could bring really distinctly different groups together within a particular hashtag to kind of centralize and galvanize that energy. And then at the same time, because social media is an ecosystem, the videos that were on YouTube or on Twitter, the chatter, the coordination in the Facebook groups to tell people what to tweet and when to say it, the YouTube videos that they would put up giving people instructions on how to be anti-vaccine activists. They reached out to the Nation of Islam because they decided that even with the Tea Party, they were still too white. And so they came up with this, this there was this conspiracy theory floating around um, that the measles vaccine gave black boys specifically autism and that the government was covering it up. This was a hashtag called CDC whistleblower. It became the foundation of Andy Wakefield's movie Vaxxed, which then again grew into kind of a national movement to galvanize. As California fought this fight, anti-vaccine movements in New York and Texas and elsewhere decided to step in to also try to dominate share of voice around this very particular niche local law. And the problem was there, there was a real asymmetry of passion, right? There was no counter movement. So you had interesting dynamics that were happening structurally on social media, ways that algorithmic amplification, ways that curation. Um, when I wanted to run ads to grow a pro-vaccine page, and I would go to Facebook's ad interface at the time, and again, this was 2015, if I typed in the word vaccine to see what I could target people on, all of the interests that would come up were anti-vaccine interests. There was no way to target a pro-vaccine community because no such thing existed. And so there were just these interesting combinations of like structure versus substance in how we had to try to fight this fight and grow this counter movement. And the takeaway for me was that this was going to be the norm. This was going to be how every political fight was going to go from there out. There was going to be this really interesting constellation, this networking, and there was going to be this, the interesting ways in which like structure and substance would kind of interact. Um, 
and the kind of unintended consequences of how the platforms were structured, plus just the sort of um, the rhetoric, the substance, the memes, the content that certain activists were very, very good at creating to really draw people in and make them uh, activists, make them um, believers and evangelists themselves. So really quickly, and then I'm going to let Ben, Ben has a question, but I want to like, I want to kind of like get a sense of scale. Um, you put this in terms of California and, and, and I really do. And like you, we, we laughed when we said fringe, but it was fringe. Like it was literally fringe. It was like hippie fringe. It was like, it was Jenny McCarthy and it was fringe and it was people that, I mean, I actually, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but like the farm that I go to in Montana and in like the summers, like was also anti-vax and was very, and like, as the anti-vax movement, this is super interesting, has moved more to the right and they align more to the left, that there has been this divergence and like they are now vaccinating their children, even they were earlier anti-vaxxers. And so there's like that the, 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 the kind of takeover of the right of the kind of some, but like, what are the numbers when you say this? Like, what were the Facebook group numbers like? Like, do you remember like how many yeah, thousands yeah, for sure. of people? Mm -hmm. I do because because at the time, uh, like I said, I was the I uh, I think I probably still am, but I was the administrator of this Facebook page, Vaccinate California, and one of the we never really grew past about three thousand thirty five hundred I think followers, maybe four thousand, because we were really geared towards how do we galvanize people around this bill, which is a very different type of activism and yeah. a very different type of movement building. It's it's, yeah. it's very time constrained, right? How do we get people activated around? an issue for that moment versus how do we build a sustained true believer community that is going to grow over time and so there was a um, there's a guy by the name of larry cook and he had no kids <laughs> no kids in school um and he was a, a naturopath of some sort you know kind of a worked for this talk naturopathic about organization. not having skin in the game <laughs> yeah i know it's actually it's like crazy yeah no no seriously yeah, well, so he was, um, he just, he kind of fashioned himself as like a social media influencer. And so all of these groups started to spring up, Californians for health choice, Californians for vaccine choice. Uh, and then they, they kind of franchised. So you started to see that emerge nationally, Texans for vaccine choice. And the choice, you hear the, the word choice in there, right? That was because again, they lost the earliest fights pushing the vaccines autism trope. And so even though these were true believers who believed in those kind of underlying, you know, sort of the woo-woo type of the conspiracy theory side of things, they instead pivoted in the entire messaging, the entire movement became oriented around this idea of choice and freedom. And so medical freedom and health choice really sprung up in a, in a very material so way. So before that, piss. was it like 400 people in these Facebook groups or was it 4,000 or was it 40,000? Before it was probably around 4,000 to 40,000. It was about 100,000 um, by the, you know, by, by about midway through, I think by the time um, it, uh, Larry started this group called Stop Mandatory Vaccination, um, which was really a jumping off point for massive harassment brigading. That was actually kind of its its central reason for existing. Which is how existing. we like, kind of like came back yeah. to when you were getting <laughs> harassed. And I was like, and you were like, should I delve into like this whole First Amendment issue? And I was like, no, <laughs> like, like, don't do that. But like, yeah, no, it was like, it was kind of like, it was so thorny and you were getting so, you were horribly harassed. Yeah, it was terrible. Well, I mean, yeah, it sucked, but there was also this like, um, you know, I, I found Danielle Citron's work at that time. I think you maybe actually. Um, I think uh, I of, sent it to you. I think you yeah. connected me to her. Yeah. So there was, um, so there was this, um, this exposure all of a sudden to how do we think about this writ large? You know, there's there's my feelings on it as an activist and as a person who's being targeted, and yeah, this really sucks. Um, <laughs> because I, I think I think you and I reconnected when I filed a DMCA to take down pictures of my kid. Yeah, um, that they yeah, had that, that, that they had um, pulled and and started throwing into harassment. I was hashtags. a copyright attorney at that point. Yeah, right, no, no, right, and yeah, there yeah. was um, and I didn't fully. And somebody at Twitter told me that was a good idea at the time, which now, funny enough, seven years later, with the benefit of hindsight, it most decidedly was not. <laughs> um, but at the same time, this was in, you know, I think a lot of people, you have to contextualize it for the era, right? Which in 2015 was the free speech wing and the free speech party. And there was really nothing that was happening on the moderation front. It was actually quite laissez-faire. And so for an executive at Twitter to tell me you should just use DMCA because the, the harassment teams don't work on the weekends, you know, that, that would like probably blow people's minds in 2021 where things are like quite different now. And actually there's arguments about are they overly uh, in, you know, enforcing on certain types of harassment and things like that. But back in 2015, 
um, I did, in fact, you know, use uh, you know copyright to try to to try to take the pictures down, and um, because it was it was my baby, actually, it was my my son. It was a picture of him at around nine months old, and I and I felt like it was weird to me that the idea of a private photo meant that I had to be naked in it, right? Like it couldn't be a private photo because someone had like pulled it from the one social profile I had neglected to lock down. Yeah. Um, and so I thought of it as a private photo, but since we all had clothes on, uh, Twitter did not. <laughs> and um, and that, that question of like what crossed a line into harassment and how you should deal with it, um, I felt like I had all of a sudden this exposure to all of the various uh, structural forms of um, problems on the internet um, in this very condensed uh, period of time. Uh, but it really made me feel excited to learn about, you know, to kind of wade in after after the activism of like, we got the bill passed, you know, SB 277 passed. Um, and then at that point, I, I felt like the kind of next battle was actually this feeling that I had, um, it sounds so stupid now in 2021, but I was like, well, Am I chicken little? I really feel like there's something really bad happening here. <laughs> Maybe I should talk about it since I'm in tech. And so I started giving talks at like Google I.O. and, you know, tech conferences that I was at. I worked for O'Reilly. Again, I was in venture capital. I had I could reach people. I, I you know, people you had, like, an you know, you had an audience. Yeah. No, so 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 that's that that's actually where I want to what I want to ask you about. So um, you are now part of the Stanford Inf Internet Observatory. You're in a you're not in tech anymore. You're not in venture capital. You're not in uh, 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 Wall Street. Uh, and to the extent that people know your name, which many people do, they know you for uh, your studies of disinformation uh, uh, at Stanford, uh, including, uh, of course, uh, you you became very uh, famous and prominent shortly after this for stuff that had nothing to do with vaccines, but had to do with Russian uh, uh, inf interference in the 2016 election. And so uh, as a preliminary matter, and I, I want to connect this back to vaccines in a minute, yeah. but describe for us how you go from being uh, the the person who you know, said, fuck you, anti-vaxxers, you know, kids should have to actually get vaccinated in California and working on that bill in 2015 to in 2016, 17, studying Russian disinformation for the Senate. Yeah, it's sort of a weird path. Um, there was an intervening, there was an intermediate step there that I didn't talk very much about publicly, which was um, at the time, as I mentioned, this was the laissez-faire era, um, the free speech wing of the free speech party and then one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter right these were the days no one, of isis i just want to say really quickly no one remembers and i remember it so well that like twitter was a fucking dumpster fire pre-2015 <laughs> like it was literally like all of our friends renee and i will say this like with like like with true like i can just say this, like, all of our friends had gone to work for twitter gotten paid a shit ton of money to go work for it because it was such a failing platform and they all got there and were like this is terrible and i would like and I, like every birthday party every everything was like them talking about why the platform was bad and then that just changed then it suddenly became about why facebook was bad like for like but whatever. Okay, but, but wait, wait. Let Renee answer my there question. Was, there, there, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, wait, wait, wait. From... Don't, <laughs> don't let Kate change the subject. I, um, don't no. Don't Sorry. I was going to say. It was my was turn to ask a question. Okay. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me explain that then. No, no, no. We're, when the, no, right. the, when the parents well, are I'll, fighting, I'll Renee. Together. Yeah, yeah. You got, you got, you got to let us sort that one out. Kate, bad. <laughs> No, I can I can bring these things together here. Ready? So the um, what was it was a dumpster fire. It was, and and you may remember it was a, you remember ISIS, right? And and this was a, I mean there were they were playing whack-a-mole with beheading videos. Do you remember that, right? And 
and and then there was some debate about what to do about the stuff that wasn't like egregious gratuitous violence but it was just the recruiting videos and the fanboys and the amplifiers and the bots this was when bots still mattered back in 2015 and this was really a thing and the re and so for me the really bizarre um thing that happened was i started writing about the anti-vaccine movement on twitter from a structural standpoint again saying these these are the, the interesting ways in which these networks are connecting with each other and i how do we think about what this is is you know i called it propaganda at the time um Miss and disinformation were not really part of my vocabulary for sure but they weren't really part of the conversation either it right. was terrorist propaganda uh, particularly because what what I was seeing structurally, the same tactics that, that the anti-vaccine movement was using were the tactics that ISIS was using. And this is not some false equivalence, the anti-vaxxers or ISIS or anything like that. It was yeah. that anybody could pick this up and do it. And that for me was the, the thing that led to me lecturing at Google I.O. And, and places, you know, like night talks and just like wherever I could saying, hey, I think that you've got some real serious problems here. I think that we're creating divergent realities, unreality, you know, extremism, right? Like things are really not good with the way that this system is designed. And it was a very simple message. I didn't have an answer for what to do about it, but I got this outreach um, from the State Department, which was running what, what they called a sprint team. And they said, look, we're, we're trying to bring some people in who think about this from a standpoint of networks, but also what should the government be doing? And I thought this is wild. What the hell do I know about <laughs> what the government should be doing? Um, but there was this, there was this, you know, I said, well, look, I'm, and just to be clear, I'm, like, I'm not a terrorism expert. I, I don't know what you want me to, to contribute here. But it was a sense of like, this was a new thing. And, and I had been writing about it and talking about it in the manifestation of this one particular group and kind of contained system over here. But they saw this connection to what they were looking at. And so I was yeah. asked to come and participate in that. Uh, in that I that, mean, as somebody who was process. a big part, a big part of those conversations at the time, I had no sense at all that the anti-vaxxers of whom into whom I had no visibility were doing the same things, you know, but this was. So 2015, just to be clear, this is the 2014, 2015. This is the same period where Jim Comey is testifying publicly that they have open ISIS investigations literally in all 50 states, which is a stunning thing, given the fact that ISIS isn't here um, and that they think about the he used to say that he thinks about social media for a certain set of kids as, you know, a devil sitting on your shoulder saying, kill, kill, kill into your ear all the time. And this is the atmosphere in which the Bureau is thinking about ISIS at the time. And it is actually a, I think it reflects good thinking at the State Department that their instinct is, wait a minute, there's this woman who's doing, you know, doing interesting stuff on, of all things, anti-vaxxers in California in state level politics, uh, who's noticing similar effects. Let's talk to her. That's actually pretty interesting, thoughtful. Remember, these are foreign policy people thinking about ISIS and they figure out to call this woman in California. That's actually pretty cool. And I think well, it's it's kind of what you would want the State Department to be doing. There was this entity called the U.S. Digital Service, right? And that was really the thing that I think um, that brokered all of these different relationships where they had tech people who didn't work for government but had some expertise that was relevant to a problem government was facing. And so the Obama White House, the U.S. Digital Service, served, uh, that was kind of, you know, the, the um, I served the State Department for that month, but the U.S. Digital Service kind of brought together the sort of team of, of outsiders, basically, who were asked to work on that. I, I, I hope that there is, that that is still happening, right, because that is what we needed. But on the subject of Russia, to, to make that to yeah, how did you end up you? working for the Senate? Well, so this is because that's a hell of a jump, <laughs> right? Like yeah, you know, no, 2014, 2015, you are um, uh, a um, uh, a California uh, mom activist uh, working for a venture capital company who's like doing vaccines. 
2017, you were doing a study for the Senate Intelligence Committee. How did that happen? So when we were doing the ISIS work, um, one of the one of the things that we did a lot of was we spoke to people at you know, a range of different entities in the government asking what they thought about this new emergent propaganda. And one of the things that kept coming up was in thinking about a response, myself and the other data scientists on the team, there were a couple of us who came from like a more tech background. Um, and then a few people on the marketing side, actually, there, there were some brand marketers who were really fascinating to hear how they thought about it. ISIS as a, as a brand, right? How do you use this platform, these tools that are designed to help companies build brands? How does a terrorist organization use them to build a brand? But as we were having these conversations, there was a sense that we couldn't respond to ISIS, that was thinking too small. We had to be thinking about who else was going to use this. And if some fly by night, you know, terrorist organization could do it, then any state actor worth its salt could and would do it as well. And so even in the days in 2015, there was the conversation that was already happening about Russia and China. And there had been an article written by Adrian Chen in the New York Times. So I was doing this work in October of 2015, but in June of 2015, this article called The Agency had come out. And it laid out, it's a fascinating article. If you haven't Adrian read it, you did absolutely such must. Great work. Sorry. Incredible piece, incredible piece, because he goes over and he becomes part of it, right? They they run an influence campaign using him. Why is this New York? They have he goes there thinking he's meeting one of the trolls who works at this troll factory, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin's Internet Research Agency, and he meets this person. He thinks he's talking to someone from the agency, and this woman brings a person who she identifies as her brother, who it turns out is some famous Russian like neo-Nazi. So all of a sudden, you have a reporter from the New York Times getting photographed in a cafe with a Russian neo-Nazi leading to a, you know, um, Prigozhin runs a whole host of media entities, including this thing called RA Fan. Um, and so the media properties, so we, we start looking at, okay, well, if this the is, internet okay, research I'm just agency now going to it, go find this article because Adrian did this and it is one of the most incredible. He's like this it is. tiny, tiny person. He is smaller than you, Ben. He is like slightly over five feet tall. He is like, he had gone all the way to Russia to meet this source and then got like basically uh, it was just like it was a gobsmacking article of like basically getting kind of like punked by Russia. And it yeah. was insane. Sorry. No, so it's a fantastic article. And so we're reading. So we're we're all talking about ISIS and we're like, maybe we should be thinking bigger. <laughs> maybe the U.S. government shouldn't be responding to this one terrorist organization. Maybe what we're seeing is an emergent new form of propaganda. We already know that there are certain state actor adversaries that have invested in propaganda for decades, if not centuries, right? They they expend extraordinary amounts of resources on it. And here is a way to reach the American public directly. And so Russia was already discussed in these conversations, but nobody had any idea of the full scope of what was happening. And this was sort of a failure of maybe imagination, maybe intelligence, but it was a, it, those of us who were talking about it, who were seeing this emerging as like a new system of information and influence, information warfare, if you will, you know, in the state actor context, we're talking about it as anyone can do this. So why wouldn't they be trying? And we should be thinking about it much more holistically. So I, so we did this work in 2015. There was a, then in January, an executive order establishing the Global Engagement Center, you know, thinking through what is the center of excellence in the State Department that brings together, uh, you know, government officials who are detailed from other parts of the government to think about propaganda. Uh, it was originally scoped for terrorist propaganda. It is then expanded into um, state state sponsored propaganda as well. And so you have the formation of this entity. So I go on with my life, you know, <laughs> um, and then I, I had a startup at the time and I was running marketing for a startup and I was still talking about this. This was when fake news became the thing, right? The Macedonian teenagers and the, um, you know, <laughs> And so there was this sense that, you know, there were a whole bunch of different problems that were happening. Facebook used to have trending topics. You may remember that wild shit was just trending constantly on Facebook's trending topics. Conservative. That I was having, always like, trending. <laughs> I mean, it like was, this, I was like just shocked by rent, how, you know? <laughs> how often it was about me. You know, I, it was, you know, I was very modest about it, of course, but um, 
you know. Are we all, are we all we've all also forgotten we just memory hold the 2016 Ben Wittes virus. That's right. There was, like... <laughs> there was I mean I would wake up in the morning and trending on Twitter would be Benjamin Wittes. It would it was terrible. Anyway, you were saying <laughs> No, so it was um, so you know, so I was I was still again very interested in this like what are the what what is the system that we have just created here and who is using it and how, and then somebody I think it I'm trying to remember which publication broke it first. It's a little bit hazy for me right now, but it was um, it was the story of the Black Matters page. It was the first real clear. I might have been I don't think it was Buzzfeed. I feel like it was um, maybe Media Matters or one of the um, one, any, one of the one of these entities breaks the story that the Russians are running a fake Black Lives Matter page on Facebook. And I thought, here we are. Oh, okay. yeah. Yes. Here it is. Like, we've been waiting for this. We thought this was coming, and here it is. And then, like I said, my, like, 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. time all of a sudden <laughs> became all consumed with looking at this stuff and finding more of it. And, again, recognizing there were certain techniques and tactics that I had kind of, like, picked up from looking at the anti-vaccine movement, ways that recommendation engines would surface certain things, ways that page rec you could crawl page recommendations, you could use the recommendation engine to find and uncover things. One of the things that I did was I went and I took the um, the Russian pages that that you know we knew existed, and I and I started searching for the pins on Pinterest. Right, I was very interested in like would I find the material on Pinterest. The answer was yes, and once I found those accounts, it started serving me more content, which then in turn I could kind of crawl and, and find more and more of this stuff. And I started, um, you know, reporters were writing about this. I remember pinging a couple um, and saying, like, here, I think that I think that this Muslim page, you know, there's some stuff that's happening over here. And there's this page that looks like it's an LGBT page. And here's this, here are these archives, here are these boards on Pinterest. And maybe you should have a look at them. And what um, they all have in common is they don't use definite articles properly. So that they're the keyboard. It is fascinating. There, there are interesting yeah. tells, but you, you actually see but them get the better Johnny over Porter time. Board. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, yeah. They, well, <laughs> they, they created an AI to insert the word the in front of things. No, yeah. they actually they actually start. They the early, early stuff has the so Russian is the generative case. The possessive is just another uh, it's another conjugation of the verb. There is no apostrophe S. There's also then no apostrophe on the keyboard. So they were using back ticks and things also. So you could actually look at some of the characters. There were a few different tells where you could kind of go through and crawl. Also, interestingly, with Pinterest, God bless the recommendation engines. After I engaged with these boards for literally 24 hours, not only did I have a whole bunch of other boards related to the content, but I had Russian language pins in my feed then at that point also. And I was like, there we go. Okay. You know, All and right. so but, it was... But, but Renee, <laughs> there, there are a lot of citizen activists who are studying this shit on their own um, at this time. There aren't very many of them that the Senate Intelligence Committee says, okay, come, you know, do a study for us. How, how did... How did that how happen? Did the, how do number one? I'm, I want. I, I still want to tie it back to the vax stuff. But how did that happen? Like, yeah. so how, how I, did you end up doing this for a living? I well, it wasn't. It wasn't my job at the time. It was. My, I know. That's my. my that, that's that, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to get you to answer. There was. There was no. There was no such job actually. Um. And so the way that that happened was. Um. I, I met Tristan Harris. He read some essays I'd written and we discovered that we had like 80 friends on, he shared an essay I wrote on Facebook. I wrote this series for a blog called Ribbon Farm um, about these men, the manifestation of, of like the new ways in which information wars were going to happen. I called it the, it's called the feed now. It didn't have a name then, but I wrote these essays in 2015, 16, 17, and 18, like one each year basically. Um, and uh, Tristan read one of them and said, hey, you know, I've been talking to Senator Warner about individual impacts of social media on human psychology. Um, we met for coffee. He was like, would you like to come with me to my next meeting with him? I would like you to tell him this thing that you're seeing with regard to the social dynamics. And I said, sure. Um, and I went and that was how I uh, how I how I met the senator and then um, began to engage with his staffers uh, on the on the topic. Um, I was really 
um, you know, small L lobbying, but I mean, just as a concerned citizen saying like, you need to have hearings, you need to have hearings, you need to have hearings. Like this is the stuff that I'm seeing, but that means that there's so much more because if this is what a recommendation engine is showing to me, that's curated. There, there's somebody somewhere understands the full scope of this data set and it should be provided to the American people. It should be at a minimum provided to some investigator to look at, to digest, to understand. Um, the question of why me is an interesting one. I think, I think it was because I was, there. <laughs> I, you know, I would like to say I have some magical justification for, you know, why I got it. People slid into my DMs asking me that question. Some very prominent academics um, slid into my DMs like, why did you get it? Um, and, and I think really the answer was, I was like, this was, for me, it became this all-consuming thing. And I said, I would, ha I would happily become an intern if that is how I can have access to continue in this investigation that I have found so consuming for the last few years. How might I be useful? Um, and that was, you know, Really yeah, but then... I think that I think that that what you're kind of hitting on and what Ben is kind of questions are getting at and what like your story is kind of telling is like a story in which like the internet has democratized our ability to be a very smart quant and to put your research in front of very smart people who will understand and appreciate it, and then also to be a very online activist and yeah, to so... put your and to put your put your uh, activism that is a and, a million and, times right, right. But it's and actually like, not the point that I was trying to make. Uh, okay. um, sure. Though I agree sure. with it a, a gazillion percent. I think I actually think Renee, your story is like amazingly inspiring um, because it's actually, among other things, a story of the birth of a field. That that this was something, and you know to all the snooty academics out there who are in Renee's DMs yeah. saying, why the, <laughs> why the fuck did you get to do this? The answer yeah. is, because I was there fucking doing the work, motherfucker, which Renee is a little bit too polite to say, but I am not. A um, 100% foot stomp Kate's point, but I actually had a different point, which uh, is that it all came back to vaccines. Yeah. Right. So it starts as state level vaccine shit in California. It goes to St. Petersburg and Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, and then within a remarkably short period of time, that those two movements just collide. And the Prigozhins of the world and the anti-vaxxers in who think they're liberals in California merge into effectively one community. And I'm interested in your sense of whether the Russian Trumpists took over the anti-vaxxers or whether the anti-vaxxers took over the Trumpists. No, I think it was, um, the internet is a series of factions, right? So the thing for me that was the harbinger was um, the way in which anti-vaccine activists, you know, the enemy, even though they would argue, arguably never vote for any Tea Party politician, the kind of Southern California, um, you know, kind of crunchy hippie types, um, they found common ground on this one thing and, the, and, you know, sort of formed like a kind of a bridge there. And that's the kind of interesting dynamic that we see where factions kind of come together to fight one online war and then disband again and then come together to fight another online war or somebody starts and i wrote this thing for the atlantic documenting the hashtag pelosi must go during the during the primaries right um and it was it was started by uh, by, by shahid batar's team he was a sort of a dsa candidate running uh, against pelosi in san francisco and so he kicks off this hashtag pelosi must go and i, I spoke to him when i was doing the research um months after the hashtag and I said I'd like to hear your reflections on that day I watched it go viral this is what I saw as a as a quantitative researcher just watching it bounce first from this community of, of DSA activists of socialists and then it was picked up by the QAnon community by Pelosi's other challenger had been this QAnon type candidate um, and so all of a sudden QAnon picked it up and they tried to marry it to this Wayfair hashtag that they were pushing at the time this Wayfair is trafficking children in their filing cabinets 
conspiracy theory that I'll spare you the details of. Um, and then, uh, you know, some of the more MAGA types picked it up because it was like a Rorschach test of a, of a hashtag, right? You could read anything into Pelosi must go. Anybody could pick it up. It was like made for virality. And that's the thing that I find so interesting about this. Again, the system versus the substance, like that the structure versus substance are two different things. How do we think about the structures that propel, that create what we call information cascades versus the substance of what hits, right? What is the rhetoric that hits? What is the... But where's, where's the art, if you will, that, that kind of goes along with the, the science? And watching him make this happen, you know, when I spoke to him afterwards, I said, what, what happened for you that day? He was blown away by the momentum, by what they could make trend. This was a very deliberate effort to get that thing trending. Hmm. But he felt that they lost control of it so quickly. It stopped being about his movement and his, you know, Medicare for all and uh, divestment and a very, you know, variety of other things that his, his actual platform was focused on. And instead it became a, a Pelosi hate fest, right? That was, you know, seized upon by all the different factions on the internet that hated Pelosi. So even though the MAGA people and the Shahid Batar community would normally be completely at odds and, you know, not really share very many policy alignments. In these moments, you see these factions come together to amplify a particular message because it serves the um, the aims of all of, of their respective causes, regardless of what they may be. And that, I think, is one of the things that's really interesting in how we understand this. Where we went with the Russia stuff, just to kind of like close the loop on that and transition it into how the anti-vaccine movement kind of popped back up in, in this capacity. Sure. The response from the platform. So we get these data sets, right? And a bunch of different folks, including proper academics at Oxford, participated in this investigations process. Um, we write the reports, you know, we detail for the Senate the structure of the data sets, what's happening, what they're doing when, how the networks behave, all the different kind of facets of it, and we turn that back over. Meanwhile, the platform reform conversation is now happening with a vengeance, right? Because this is through 2018 now. And so people are outraged at the way that the systems have been co-opted by foreign propagandists to target unwitting Americans, to, in, to infiltrate activist movements. We have the virtualization of the agent of influence, right? fake people, fake personas pretending to be yeah. Americans. And the policies that come out of that period are policies really oriented around ideas of authenticity. And that's a huge and interesting phenomenon, right? So I thought about this, again, from the capacity of somebody who had studied the anti-vaccine movement, I felt that you either had to grow a counter movement or you had to reset the playing field in terms of the structures, right? And, and, and actually both of those things were likely to have to happen. And that was the way of the future. But with the Russian stuff, um, with the foreign interference, there was this distinct variable authenticity and they could set policies, and this came to be called the coordinated and authentic behavior policies, in which they would disrupt networks that were inauthentic, that were pretending to be something they were not. Now, the anti-vaxxers were absolutely authentic in every yeah. way, and they still are. And this was where, you know, I, I found this like a really interesting phenomenon. I thought in a way this is impactful. This is addressing the national security piece. There's a hmm. preservation of, you know, per Kate's, you know, work, freedom of expression here. We're not arguing like the problem with what the Russians were putting out was not the substance of the content. It was actually relative. It was propaganda, but it wasn't hate speech. It wasn't outrageous. It wasn't calls for violence. It was it was they were really just kind of cribbing from the most extreme facets of American society and just sort of constantly pushing at the edges, widening the gaps, you know, reinforcing people in their respective identities, and then positioning all these entities, these identities in opposition to each other. But there's nothing, there's nothing um, violent about that style of, of propaganda. They're not calling for the overthrow of the US government. And so what you see instead is all of the policy mitigations start to congeal around this idea of authenticity, who is the speaker? And that's where we go in 2018, which then has some profound implications downstream when all of a sudden we've effectively like that's the low hanging fruit in a lot of ways because we've left the structures untouched yeah. while I have like, mixed feelings about play. this. Me too. I, I, yeah. I have very mixed feelings at the time. And this is where, you know, Kate, you and I have spoken about this. There's a feeling that you're like living through <laughs> history. Like Alex says this too. This idea that Alex make, Demos, you, sorry. Yeah. Like, you, who you worked make, with, who has been on the show many times before, but like who worked with, with Renee and, uh, and me 
break frequently. Yeah. And so you do what you can in the moment because it seems like the best possible option. And you don't have the luxury of, of, in you know, thinking about all of the negative externalities that may then come from that policy decision down the road. Yeah. I mean, so hold on. I'm going to stop you because we have to go to audience questions. We only have eight minutes left ish. Um, but I also just want to say that like, one of the things that I mostly wanted to say, and you have now kind of just done a beautiful job of like, even though you didn't get to sew it up and like kind of tell us the whole tale and hopefully you can come back and kind of, we can like continue this conversation. But like one of the things that you're telling and that I think is so important as a student of empirics and a student of history and a student of law is that like you go back and you look at the history of this. And if someone goes back, Renee, and looks at the history of you and looks at the history of me, they see some type of history in which like she took on anti-vaxxers and then her whole life became about anti-vaxxers. And there was this like constant stream all the way through of anti and like, there's no understanding of how this movement changed and how it like undulated. And there is like all of these things. And that's what I kind of think is like the important part that is missing from history and that is important to kind of sew back in as we go back through and tell even like the most recent history of how these things have happened. Um, because I do think it does get taken up over the long haul, but Dr. Doom, you have a question and please go ahead. Um, we only have a few minutes. So I just asked. It, it, it's not sure. brief questions, yeah. brief answers. It's not really a question. It was a story that I was going to tell. Oh, and okay. It's pro and there's probably not enough time for this, but I actually think the roots of this actually start in homeopathy, which uh, is, a, is a much earlier uh, phenomenon of a, of a pseudoscience. And what happened with homeopathy is that it's not based on scientific principles. However, the, libera the, the sort of libertarian thing that you're talking about that started to, uh, started to uh, freedom from vaccination actually was softened up by the supplement industry. So what, what happened is when Orrin Hatch kind of uh, allowed this out, there was a whole questioning of what they started to call allopathic, uh, allopathic medicine and questioned uh, evidence-based science. And I wasn't aware of this at all when I was in, when I was in uh, medical school. However, when I started- I covered that damn bill in 1996 as a young legal reporter for Legal Times there... when the freaking dietary supplements industry in Utah got hatched to front it for them. Well, uh, think, think about all the multi-level market. I mean, it really, I hate to say it, but it all fits together as a viral- as Yeah, a Dr. Viral Doom is, is channeling the word of fucking God right now about the relationship between okay. this weird regulatory- when you yell at me for going over for the show. No, no, I'm just, I'm just saying <laughs> this is not Dr. Doom being eccentric. This no, is an important precursor that. movement or concurrent evolution movement That's was right. the dietary, the fact that you can buy all kinds of dietary supplements in your drugstore with affirmative health claims attached to them. With no Thank you, Orrin Hatch. And, and with no evidence and nothing to stop. And the only reason why that was going on was back in 1906, there was a homeopathic uh, um, practitioner who basically blocked the, the law that was going to create the FDA, well, precursors to the FDA, because he wanted to continue having homeopathy. So that was added to the law and was grandfathered for homeopathy. And homeopathy is treated as a drug, even though it's it's absurd. Anyway, but I was, un I was unaware of this. And when I was, uh, I was recruited up to Microsoft to start Microsoft Health. And we built, actually, the idea of this was, I, I hate to say it, I was very Millsian, but I thought, Boy, I, I buy into this notion that that everyday patients can be consumers, lot you know, reasonable consumers of health information and make better decisions for themselves. And I was fully bought into that. And so we built our our first version of Microsoft Health as an online service to do that. And I I, I still remember the day we turned it on, and when we turned it on, the boards opened, and all of a sudden. Wham! All of this stuff that I never knew existed, which was this anti-vax stuff, 
with mothers going on and on. This is 96, by the way. So it's prior to Wakefield. And uh, we, we tried all kinds of things to try to give uh, you know, evidence-based information and explain the, the explain the reasons and the evidence against. Them. Right. So we need we need to resolve this toward a question. Or uh, I don't really have, I don't really have a question as to say that I do understand what you're talking about and I do understand the transmogrification, especially when you think, gee, we're 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 making this medium so that people can actually bring up uh, accurate information. And in fact, the Millsian idea was completely overrun almost yeah. immediately, almost immediately. Yeah. And here, and here's, That's and I'll, I'll leave yeah. you with this metaphor. Most mammalian uh, bodies, uh, the, you know, there's an adaption and they have compartmentalization between the parts. And it's thought that the evolutionary reason for this is to prevent infection from spreading, to become septic. And what the internet did to the body politic is it penetrated all of these uh all of these um frictions between the different compartments yeah. and we have a septic body politic now anyway i'll leave it at that no all right a, thank that's you that's a good way of, but well, yeah the lack of friction richard wattenberger i'm going to ask you to be very brief okay. and you always are thank all you right. friend i'll try to be brief um so we've seen spectacular cases of people like dr uh, like uh, dr oz getting on these crazy bandwagons, but have you seen um, like otherwise maybe sane physicians jumping onto the anti-vax um, bandwagon and what, what's going on there? There's always been, um, there's a great paper by Tara Smith um, from 2012, I think, that documents the kind of actors in the anti-vaccine movement. And one of the groups that she describes is called the doctors. And it's, uh, it's people who become uh, skeptical for one reason or another. And one very prominent example of this, if, if anybody's a parent of a certain age, probably had like a, a Bob Sears parenting book, right? Um, where he goes from, he's a, he's a, he was a pediatrician in um, Capistrano, I think is the name of the like kind of sector of, uh, of Southern California, LA. And he originally in some of his early parenting books is arguing that maybe vaccines should be spaced out. You know, there's this, this idea after Wakefield um, that vaccines cause autism and that perhaps spacing them out or, you know, might, might creating an alternative schedule might inspire confidence in parents who are terrified that their child will become autistic if they're vaccinated. And he goes through this very interesting arc where he becomes increasingly more and more, um, more and more anti-vaccine and starts, you know, telling parents, don't get too loud about it. You need to hide in the herd is how he says it. Um, you know, don't tell people that you're not vaccinating. He's actually arguing in some ways that they should not become big evangelists for it, that they should just quietly do it, which is in some ways I would argue maybe kind of like worse. Um, but there is, there are these, you know, particularly in the context of right now, COVID vaccines, there's some, um, as the, one of the things that's been fascinating about COVID that we didn't get to talk about is the extent to which a lot of the misinformation related to MMR, there's a like a ridiculous body of literature documenting how safe the MMR vaccine is over a period of decades. And that doesn't exist for COVID. And so you do see more of the kind of um, debates among physicians on Twitter, for example, of who, not so much who should get vaccinated, that kind of there's a large degree of support for that quite early, questions about how should doctors speak to pregnant patients about it because the vaccines had not been evaluated in the context of pregnant women yet. How should doctors talk to their patients about vaccinating children? So there's this um, spectrum where in the in, in, an, in a time of incomplete consensus, you see more of that happening. And then and, I and think also, there are... And also people should be candid that like, you know, the the safety data on these vaccines if you were dealing with a situation unlike MMR, right, the situation with COVID, if you're dealing with a situation in which the consequences are less dangerous than COVID, you might actually wait a while before approving. Like we don't usually approve vaccines that quickly, but you know, it, it, COVID is really fucking dangerous, right? It's killed 800,000 people in the United States this year. and. So your risk potential, reasonable risk profile or, or tolerance for a vaccine for it may be a little bit higher. 
And so that I think that that question COVID really hits on all of these areas where the COVID misinformation is not inauthentic. There's, you know, some of it comes about from a yeah. question of like, where is consensus? What do we know right now? Our institutions have not covered themselves in glory, candidly, in many ways, and <laughs> there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, but it's on full display, leading to even further erosion and public trust in the communications they do put out. Uh, so you do start to see this spectrum of beliefs ranging from physicians who are, you know, as Ben is saying, um, making kind of risk-based assessments for particular patient populations, particularly early in the time at which the vaccines were rolled out. Um, there are then also, uh, there are the people who become like the America's frontline doctors figures who, you know, are already sort of way off the rails and, um, you know, kind of come out of communities that argue that um, HIV is a hoax and reject the germ theory of disease. And it's hard to tell who's who when you're looking at them on Twitter. Everybody is yeah. put at a fairly even That's, playing field. That and is that the is million the, dollar point. Yeah. And it's that when you that. when you see somebody speaking authoritatively on Twitter and they've got a blue check mark by their name, you have no idea if that check mark is validating that they are uh, a serious immunologist or if that blue check mark is validating that they really are uh, a PhD from the Quackery School of Quackery. Uh, and to. and like all it's saying is that they're validating that there are somebody known. And that is actually not a reflection of the quality of the information they're providing. Which gets exactly to like Renee's point and my point earlier, which is about like how we both got tracked back to authenticity of humans and like the identity of people. And Renee, you're going to come on again. We're going to have you on again because mostly you are... I really, I also, because first of all, you're a great American as Ben is about to tell you. <laughs> yeah, but... you are a great American. And but by the I way, a freaking say... inspiring story because like, like, for those of you who haven't like taken away the key story here, this is like a woman in her basement or maybe in her <laughs> attic who's like obsessed with the anti-vaxxers who yeah. ends up taking and on Yevgeny Prigozhin on behalf of the Senate exactly. and then going to Stanford to study disinformation. I mean, and this is like- she has to prove her worth to somebody. It's Why like, you? you know, <laughs> fucking great story. And uh, also Renee is, unbelievably good fun to have a drink with uh and when you get her going railing about the uh school board in san, san francisco, francisco it is a thing to behold uh we will next time all of, yes all of that is to say that uh we will be back uh wait 55 minutes and 20, 22, 22 you, got hours. To, you got to remember the 22 hours yeah i know 22 hours and 55, sorry, like the, the, the <laughs> subtraction thing. Yeah, that's 22 hours hard. and 50, 55 minutes from now. Uh, It'll be we'll, cheese night, the special annual New Year's resolution cheese night on In Lieu of Fun. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get truffle brie for it. Really? I am. I have some out, big time New Year's resolutions, Renee, and I think, Renee. I, and I think we're going to bring on Paula to talk about her New Year's resolution thread. Renee, do you have New Year's resolutions? Um, I I do like New Year's goals. I always like write down a couple of things I want to accomplish over the course of the year. So I got to sit down and iron out what those are going to be. Well, I, feel free to join us. So much. <laughs> feel free to oh. come back. Feel free yeah. to join us. Feel free to we, join we us. Love, we, oh, like, be fun. It's actually, this is actually very, I mean, I got to say that this is like a pretty great crowd. So we would love to have you back anytime. So uh, until then. All right. Friends. Thanks for having me, we guys. We don't fun. have fun amazing. anymore, but no we fun. do have. I thought I did uh, that already. Oh, no, did no you didn't. You actually didn't oh, say that. Oh, you, I didn't. Because okay, I cut sorry. you off and talked about other things. We don't have fun anymore, but we do have. Um, uh, uh, Measles, uh, mumps, and discreet rubella. groups of of assholes pursuing their own interests online <laughs> that use the same tactics and occasionally have overlapping objectives, and that's where things get really upsetting. Why don't we have vaccines against those guys? Bye, guys. Uh, yeah.